This is the time when everybody has to come together. If you see an opportunity, if you see something that makes somebody else's life better, that's what it's about. Gotta do it. Hey, it's Ari Santiago, President and CEO of IT Direct, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Made in America podcast. We've got Brian Montanari today, President and CEO of Habco. Brian's a great friend and really happy to have him back on the podcast. Brian, thank you so much for coming out yeah, today. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Quite a bit different today than it was last time we were here. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Business has changed, but we are still going to start off with the same two questions, sure. Brian. So what do you what do you make and why do you make it? Sure, we uh, we participate in the aftermarket of the aerospace industry. So all of our product supports the aircraft or engine when it's in for service. Um, we support both fixed wing and rotor wing, commercial and military, and we support the engine and the airframe. So we're really ingrained in the aftermarket of the aerospace industry. Yeah, well, listen, we're going to get into that because that's a pretty tough market to be in these yeah. days. But, you know, let's just take this. Uh, you, you've been on the podcast before. You sort mm -hmm. of talked about the why Habco exists. But maybe let's ask this question. Why are you in manufacturing, Brian? What's got what keeps you in it? What what excites you about what you guys are doing at Habco? Manufacturing is just exciting to begin with. I mean, everything is manufactured. You look around, everything you touch went through somebody's factory. And that's you know, one of the things that growing up I didn't quite think about. You know, I looked at the the tall skyscrapers, wanted to have a corner office in a big financial building somewhere downtown in New York City. Um, but when I got my feet wet in manufacturing, I just loved it and realized early in my career that I like to affect the bottom line, not just analyze it. Uh, and Habco is really interesting. It's been um, actually uh, two days ago was my 13 year anniversary with Habco. Oh. And, uh, so it's been 13 years. It's been an amazing run, we, you know, just to see where the business has gone in that time period, but also the industry. I mean, industry is really interesting. Um, you know, I just joked a minute ago about when I was here back in January, so much of our focus was, you know, so many of the things that we were excited about was the commercial right. the aerospace industry. And right now, you know, it's a, it's a little bit tough of an environment. So even though it has a huge tail, huge opportunity, there's a lot of great things in the aerospace industry. Every day is a struggle. Every day is a challenge. Every day is exciting. And there is a lot of aircraft out there flying and being maintained. So it's a great opportunity for Habco. That's fantastic. And are we going to have to blame you? Lucky year number 13, yeah. 2020, <laughs> sure. really bringing it. Are we going to start? You're bringing in 13 <laughs> with a bang, Brian. So, yeah. so yeah. thank you. So listen, for those that remembered you from the last episode, we talked a lot about how you started at Wiremold. Mm -hmm. and, and those that are in the manufacturing space know how uh, Wiremold is known for lean. And you've been involved in lean. But just briefly to kind of refresh the audience, you know, what, what are your thoughts on lean what's your experience and how have you brought that to bear you know just in your regular uh, career in manufacturing yeah i mean simply for me the way i always talk about lean and i actually taught uh, as an adjunct professor i taught lean at eastern connecticut state university for five years so whenever i talk about lean for me it's not a thing it's a philosophy right a lot of folks talk about oh we're, we're lean and mean uh, lean for me is just about doing things better than it was before and that's it's a passion you know, it's the, anything you do, even if it's something I implement, and I know I talked about this the last time and I still feel that way. There's things that I put in place that I implement and it's so easy to say, okay, well, it's perfect, <laughs> but there's always a better way. And yeah. to me, that's what lean's about. It's about breaking things apart and making them better than it was before. Yeah, honestly, it's like it's sort of one of the most exciting things for me about just technology. And I see it in manufacturing too. It's like anyone who knows about IT, right? It's just like, seems like every day, every hour, something new is coming out, which means anything we did yesterday, last week, or God forbid, years ago, right. a better way has to be out there. Uh, and it's such a driving force. And I think it's been interesting, the conversation we had about lean and how much it's really propelled your career, you know, starting from what you learned at Wiremold and seeing mm -hmm. it in action and then taking it to other places. And I'm just curious, in the environment that we're in right now, obviously there's a big change. We talked about the aerospace downturn and just what's kind of happening. And now I wonder, do you lean on, <laughs> lean on yeah. your lean background now more than ever? Is this an opportunity to kind of take that there's always a better way approach and use it to make the business better today more than there was even six months ago? Even more so today. And the reason why I feel that way is, especially in the commercial aerospace industry with how many, uh, the biggest, the big downturn we have and how many companies out there are looking for work. There are so many companies I know of that were 100% focused on the commercial aerospace market. They're laying folks off and they're doing whatever they need to to try to capture business. And now that becomes a threat. It's a challenge on the military side because you've got all these commercial customers who are, you know, will do anything in their power to try to go off and get work. And I would do the same thing. Sure. And yeah. so we now need to be double down, triple down on our lean efforts and in our training so that we can 
continue to write the ship. We're not perfect. We have a lot of a lot of issues, and every day we're trying to trying to work through those. But we have to work through those in a lean mindset because whatever business we capture, we want to keep. And there's still a big world out there that want to capture more. You know, I want to replace some of the commercial business that's down. I know it will come back. I'm not exactly sure when. I've got my <laughs> my thoughts on that. But I want to keep my employees employed, and I don't want to be one of the companies that has to let people go. So we have, we're going to double down on our training, double down on lean, double down on improving. So let's talk, dig into a little bit on that, like just sort of strategic wise. And then I want to ask you some specific COVID stuff, yeah. but you know, so, so talking about kind of looking at lean and doing some implementation and doubling down and just walk me through your thought process. You know, it's, it's hard, right? And those of us that are running businesses, no one wants to let anybody go. We want to keep everything together, but we also know that there's realities of supply and demand. Right. So just walk me through your thought process. Like yeah. you're looking at what's happening. You're seeing demand changes. You know, there's competition coming in. Walk me through, walk the audience through like, okay, so what does Brian do? You look at it. How do you start applying solutions? Yeah. Well, look, look to say that the last four months have been a challenge is a complete understatement. And I don't mean this to come out the wrong way, but the easy thing to do is to to downsize. Mm. It's an easy business. To, it's hard on on the emotional side, mm. but it's an easy business decision to make. Now I'm, we have a lot of military business, and I know the commercial business will come back. And I want it when it when it comes back. I want us to be stronger than when we went through when we started this pandemic. So the discussion that we have amongst the executive team, what we wanted to do is we wanted to maintain our entire workforce. And so far we have, we've been able to do that. We haven't done any layoffs, any furloughs, no pay reductions or anything. Um, and what we're doing is we will go back and we do a lot of employee surveys at least once a year. And we have a lot of all hands meetings. And one of the biggest things that we keep hearing is training. You know, it's like training and communication are always the two things that come up in, in employee surveys. <laughs> And we've implemented an ERP system a handful of years ago, and I think we do okay with it, but there are still a lot of folks who don't follow the procedures or don't know, we have new people that have come in. You know, 2019, we, we onboarded 42 new employees, and they're being trained by people that are new. <laughs> right. And so we made the decision that during, during, uh, during the second quarter that we were going to focus on our Epicor training. And we spent more money on training in Q2 than we have in any prior quarter since the implementation. We have a lot of folks that were working from home, and yes, we could still be productive from home, but now we're not having as many meetings. So there is still available capacity. So we're doing remote training on Epicor. We had our Epicor consultant uh, work with our internal team and everybody got an opportunity to go get trained at high levels and in, in detail levels. So now I don't want to hear people complain about <laughs> lack of training. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but we we're should be it. we should be stronger coming out of this and right. we should be able to use our system better. And we looked at just the efficiencies within the business and how we can go off and become more effective. So, I mean, awesome. And I'm glad that you're doing that, but I'm just going to like push even try and go even a little bit deeper. Like, listen, are you sacrificing profits? Right. I mean, cause we all want to keep everybody right. Yep. And, and, and you've been able to, which is just tremendous. You know, I'm very fortunate to say we've been able to do the same and, and many others have, but what's the decision is the decision going, listen, we're just going to shrink our margins. Our goal is going to be maybe just over break even to keep the team together, to bounce back. Like when you look at it, that perspective, because if demand is down and orders are down, we can invest in training, but we don't know when that payback is going to be Correct. like, so, so what's the calculus there? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So when I look at what our plan was coming into 2020, it was going to be a record year, high, high growth over high prior high growth years, mm -hmm. high profit over, over the profitable years. And this was a big hit, you know, it was, you know, we, with the amount of investments we've been doing and putting back into the business, whether it's capital, whether it's people, whether it's investing in different elements of, of the aftermarket, this was the big year for us, right? right? And it's a hit. We will not have the same year because Q2 was a, a bit of a hit. Fortunately for us, we were able to participate in the PPP. And I think the spirit of the PPP was to keep people employed. Mm -hmm. So yes, it, Q2 is not going to be the quarter we wanted. We are going to have a financial hit. Right. Um, we will still be profitable, but it won't be what we were looking for. But in my in my heart of hearts, I truly believe that's the intent of the PPP. Keep everybody employed. Use that money to invest, you know, to keep everybody employed, to help make payroll, to help do those things. And if we had some reduced uh, capacity, if we had increased capacity to reduce demand, let's use that time wisely. Right. Is it a gamble? Sure. Is it going to come back? I can't promise you, but I do know that if it does come back, we're prepared for it. Right. Well, how, how long is that going to, in, in your mind, are you saying clear, I 100% with you on the PPP, right? Right. I, I think, if you, I mean, listen, if you took the PPP money and laid people off, you know, right. I'm not a fan of that. Right. So, so I mean, that that's, yeah, so many things wrong with that. But, right. but having said that, 
the training's great if we can keep the people long enough to need to be able to get to a point where we can apply it. Correct. And so neither of us have a crystal ball, or if you do, you've lied to me about it and haven't shared it with me, and <laughs> I don't have one. So, right. so uh, having said that, I feel extremely confident that people will fly again. Mm -hmm. I mean, we like to be near other people. People like to travel. You know, there's things about business and other things that, you know, we're not going to be doing Zoom weddings forever, right? I mean, right. that's just not going to be a thing. So it will come back, but it likely will take probably 18, Easy, 24 yeah. months just to get back to where we were, say, like end of last year, end Correct. of 2019. So PPP runs out long before that. Mm -hmm. So what when you look at and say, okay, so PPP is running out, say, in August, mm -hmm. and I may have another August and a half to get to, to really see the, the commercial back to where it was when we started. Are you guys able to just say, well, listen, commercial was only a third of the business or 20% or whatever, and we'll just figure it out. Are you saying, you know, we're willing to go some extended on reduced profitability? Like, what does that, what does that look like? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a, a couple of things. One is um, the mindset that this will not be the profitable, as profitable of a year <laughs> as we want. So we know there's going to be a hit and, and I'm willing to, have that discussion with our board of directors and i know they'll be supportive of it to know what our growth plans are and were and we still have some major business development opportunities and we just don't want to be in a position where we could offer nose to spider face mm -hmm. right we, i want to maintain that workforce and if it never comes back we'll make those tough decisions right. at that point in time but right now we can maintain this for another quarter or so in our growth plans part of the growth plans was hiring more people. So we're just not hiring as many yeah. people as well. So, you know, our, our, the level that we're at now, we still have a few, we still have, I think, five open positions that we're looking to fill right now in different areas of the business, but we're just not gonna hire as many people mm -hmm. as we initially intended in order to meet the demand that, or the increased demand. Um, we're continuing to focus on our, our DOD, our military business on both the fixed wing and rotary wing side. We've got some good business development opportunities that have all been slowed down over the last three to four months just in the in the progression mm -hmm. of talks and so if we can get those back online and if it you know if they start to come back online in q4 or q1 of next year everything's good <laughs> so so if i if i could summarize a little bit of that it really helps to go into a problem being strong absolutely yeah all right. the investments that were put in between 2010 and 2019 all added up to put you on a nice trajectory so that the conversation isn't man we were just kind of limping along now what do we do it's saying we were we were on the balls of our feet in growth mode so we're just going to like slow that back a little bit so your quote you know your almost staff reduction is lack of hiring that's right not losing staff that's a tremendous way to look at yeah, it yeah and the other side too is when we when i was here last time we talked a lot about the license agreements and how much our business has grown mm -hmm. and so much of the demand that is placed on us we didn't have the capacity or capability to do it all so you know somewhere about 45 percent of our business was outsourced to sub-tier suppliers i don't need to outsource as much now <laughs> All right, we can, we've, we've invested, you know, quite a bit in capital equipment over the last uh, 18 months in particular. We've got two more machines being delivered this quarter, so we're still continuing to move forward with bringing that capability and capacity inside to be less reliant upon suppliers that I can't control. That's been one of our biggest frustrations over the last couple of years is the amount of business that we have to give other, other companies. And I'm happy to be participating in that supply chain but our supply chain hasn't been able to keep up either. So our performance is directly proportioned to our supplier's performance. And if I can bring the the control of that, the quality and the demand in house, now I can look at myself in the mirror as opposed <laughs> to having to look at somebody else. Yeah, easier to lean out a process that you control when right. you're instead of having all of it. Actually, I wanna pull back on that thread, but before I do is one last thing about the change I wanna ask you about. A number of people that listen to this podcast, much like yourself, you know, have investors, right? So yep. you're, I mean, you're part owner, but you've got investment committees and a board of directors that are meaningful, yep. you know, not an advisory board, but a real board that has their money in on this That's thing. Right. And, you know, we talked before and we've talked privately as well. They have goals and they've pushed you to have tremendous goals. And I know that they're really uh, proud of you and you've created a great name for yourself and what you've done at Habco. Um, what's their feelings about where things are going and, and what are you hearing and, and how are you I don't want placating, it's not the right word, it's popped in my mind, but explaining and getting, bringing them on board for the ride when it's not the ride maybe they thought it was going to be going into the year. Sure. You know, I, I'm, I, I really do love my board of directors. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a group of individuals that I'm humbled to sit around on a regular basis, whether it's at board meetings or just regular meetings or phone calls. Um, and they are far more 
experience is far more successful than than I am and that I could imagine being. And it's just, it's amazing to see the support that we've gotten from them. Now, this wasn't, an, an, when we bought the business at the end of 2012 with the, the group of investors, sure, would people like a really quick exit? But that wasn't, that wasn't the focus. You know, we were a very, very small business, 20 employees. And we looked at what we could do in five years versus it, to get a quick return versus what we could be in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, so we're, you know, seven and a half years into the investment. And where we are today is farther, much bigger than we would have been if we didn't think bigger and if mm. we were, if, or if we were looking for a very quick exit. Now, that being said, it has been seven and a half years. Mm. But I think what we look at and what the board sees and what we continue to look at is the aftermarket of the aerospace industry is prime. Mm. You know, every aircraft needs to be maintained. And then one of the things I look at coming out of the pandemic, there's a lot of aircraft that have been sitting. Before it can go back up in the air, it's got to be checked mm -hmm. and double checked, maintained. So our growth has been really, really good. We, on the profit side, we put a lot of it back in the business so we can continue to invest in it. But every time we hit a threshold that we're shooting for, we could see the next threshold. Well, that's just another year or two. We could be there. <laughs> and to think how far we've come in the seven and a half years and another three years, another five years, how big of a player we could be in the aftermarket. When we bought the business, you know, we're 20 employees out of one, one facility in Connecticut. I have three facilities in Connecticut now, one in the Czech Republic, and we have about 100 employees. Right. And we are still just scratching the surface of, yeah. of the aftermarket. So there's that fine balance. And I bet if you pooled all of our investors, some would say, get me out now. <laughs> you know, because it's been seven and a half years. Sure. And the ones that are closer to the business and closer to the industry understand what the potential could be. So are there challenges having, I mean, whenever you've got multiple people, it's hard to get unanimity. Is there any challenges having a board where some people may be saying, time to get out or are you guys leveraging that? I think the board is pretty much on the same page because we speak often. Mm -hmm. um, I can't speak for the, the greater investor group, um, but uh, I'm sure there are some who, who would, would like, if they had an opportunity to get out at today's valuation compared to where we bought it, they would do it. <laughs> sure. Right. But, you know, I, but you we're know, in it to win it. We're in it to win it. And, uh, you know, I'm sure this is the investments that the investors have made is not something that they need in order to put food on the table at this point. In time. So, <laughs> right. it's, it's, so an, it's an opportunity for a bigger return. Right. And so are you finding that even through this, you're able to manage it effectively and get people on board to still see the long haul, even though we're going through a bump right now? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a challenge. And, and it's frustrating because, you know, like I said a few minutes ago, 2020 was the year yeah. it was, it, that we, were, we worked so hard for. We, we, all those license agreements that we've done had been onboarded. We had the demand. We have the backlog. Thank, you know, thank God for the backlog that we have. Um, then to say, okay, COVID <laughs> hits, step back. It's another year of another mm. year of investment. It's another year of, you know, what do we need to do to, to be able to come out of it in 2021? Right. right? So it's... But they're, uh, we got time, right? That's it. Nothing but nothing but time. Nothing right. but time. So let's let me talk to kind of transition to something else really quickly, which is, you know, people that are kind of around the space, aerospace in particular, but just even manufacturing, Connecticut, anyone that's involved in the CMC, certainly ACM, but even other groups. When we when when I talk about it and people talk about sort of COVID nineteen response, Habco's name comes up almost every time. You guys have been a leader in addressing the COVID crisis from a business perspective from day one. I mean, mm -hmm. you, Brian, you and I have talked a lot offline and you're even still leading that people don't even know about going into the future. What drove you to take that position? Why did you decide to take that leadership role uh, at Habco in COVID? It's the right thing to do. You know, um, I care a lot about our employees. I care a lot about our customers. And I think it would be irresponsible to not, you know, there are th I have a wife, I have kids, I know every employee has family and to put people in harm's way is just irresponsible. And that's the way we looked at it from day one is if we looked at this and said, if it was our sons and daughters or spouses or parents working at Habco, what protection would you want to do? I mean, I know early on the, fo the fights I had with my parents on the <laughs> phone about don't go to Zumba class, mom. You know, like, <laughs> so if, if that's the passion I had for my mom and my dad and my siblings and my kids and my wife, I have to have that same passion for our employees. And we made the decision early on. I started tracking this in February. I mentioned we have a facility in the Czech Republic and it hit there earlier. So you know, I maybe had a little bit quicker insight to that crystal ball that mm. was about to hit, but still didn't understand 
still don't understand how it's <laughs> going to play out. But our focus on day one when we started these, the, the executive team conversations in February was we have to put three things in place or three focuses in place and do not waver. And those three things were the health and safety of our employees, our customers, and our suppliers. So that's the physical Mm -hmm. space and how we treat people. Number two was, you know, the flexibility that we have to provide for our employees. How many people, how many employees became teachers or caretakers or caregivers, right? And so knowing that people now have young kids that have to be taught at home, we got to provide flexibility mm -hmm. where they have to take care of their mom and dad. So that was number two. And then number three, which was really the, uh, the challenge, do both of those without sacrificing customer deliveries. And those three things come in conflict every day. So I feel proud of the team, you know, the executive team and, and the greater Habco team just being relentless on that. We, you know, we bought, fortunately, we were able to buy all of our PPE back in, in, on March 3rd. So we actually had everything early. We still have a supply left. We've been able to re-up some of our supplies. We started masks and gloves early on, temperature checks. So months later or weeks later when everybody else, when it was mandated to do it, and there was some uproar for us. It was just part of what we were doing. It was, you know, do I still find people with their masks down a little bit? And you got to point at them. <laughs> but for us, it just became part of the culture. And, and, and I guess the reason why is because without our customers, we don't have work. And without our employees, we don't have work. So we've got to prioritize the same thing with the suppliers. And it's, you know, it's amazing to me to see how many companies really took this serious and how they're doing because of it and how many still to this day don't. And that it, it's mind boggling to me. So uh, before I get to that, I actually want to ask you a question about that extra comment right there. One thing that's always impressed me in particular recently because of our conversations, you guys went out and bought that, th these tests and you guys yeah. went out and sourced and found COVID tests yep. that you could deploy, and uh, uh, deploy excuse me, yeah when they're when they weren't around basically mm -hmm. when no one could get a test except if they were like in the hospital and sick yeah. which at that point it was almost like of course we have covid right. um you guys were doing testing just talk about how you did that and, and again you know i guess you really just said the why but just talk a little bit about the educate the audience what what did you guys do with this testing how does it work sure i mean that was the one thing for me again i we do these surveys and we, we you know i'm a person that would just walk the floor every day we'd have all hands meetings so i can talk to people and now i've got half my workforce working from home i've got split shifts where even me i'm not able to be there and have any shift overlap and so i was trying to find ways to communicate with all the employees so i started a youtube channel on march 23rd every day I was sending out a youtube video I got pretty good at it at, uh, at editing. <laughs> Better watch your job. I might be coming after it. But um, it was just a way to to make sure everybody was hearing what was going on at the state level, what was going on at the federal level, what was going on at the Habco level, and why. And then we were soliciting feedback. And one of the, the biggest things that kept coming back, this is like early early March or mid March, was okay. I feel good, but how do I know I don't have it? You know. Keith says he feels good, but how do I know Keith doesn't have it? Mm -hmm. And we walk into the same, we use the same bathroom. Even though we're wearing gloves and masks and sanitizing and sanit you know, doing all this stuff, it was this big unknown. So it was definitely a desire to say, okay, I want to test my employees. But yet every day I hear President Trump or, you know, uh, or the governor talking about testing, 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 and it's not available. I said, okay, well, I'll wait our turn. You know, it's, hopefully it comes available and hopefully we can do our part. But one day I saw a post on LinkedIn, you know, power of social media, right? Um, from a friend of mine who our daughters play hockey together, who works for a company. And I saw him put a post on LinkedIn that said, very excited. We're going for FDA emergency use uh, authorization for our uh, saliva test. So that was on a Friday. Ooh, I knew Dom, a good guy to drink beer with, but I didn't really know <laughs> what he did for a living. And then on Sunday, I saw him put another post that said, you know, we're so excited we have uh, authorization on the Emergency Use Act for our saliva test. I picked up the phone. I said, Dom, tell me about this. Can I buy it? Well, you know, you, you, it's really for the healthcare. You have to, you know, be connected with, uh, you know, the FDA and you've got to be able to go through, you know, it's got to go through a healthcare provider and all this stuff. I'm like, Dom, if we can find a way for industry to be able to use this, and especially at that time, you know, it was, you know, essential businesses. And all the manufacturing at the time was essential. I said, if if we're considered essential, and now I'm not by any stretch of the imagination comparing Habco to healthcare front lines. Right, so right. don't misinterpret anybody when I'm saying <laughs> this. But if we're essential, the, the, these businesses are essential for a reason, whether it's the DOD side of the house or, or whatever, it's important for us to maintain operations and maintain that continuity. 
So I, I said, Dom, how can we do this? Is there a way? So we started brainstorming. This is on Sunday. And he worked around the clock. I worked as, as hard as I could around the clock as well. He worked with his management team. We found a, a process that would work. I worked with our HR and our attorneys. Will this work? <laughs> and we developed from Sunday to Tuesday a process that, that allowed industry to buy and do the administry. And that was the great part. We didn't have to send anybody anywhere else. We can do it right at Habco. So I bought the in kits the parking lot, in the parking lot, right? <laughs> so that was Sunday to Tuesday. That Tuesday was April 7th. I bought 200 kits on that date. They showed up on the 9th. We finished the process. That next Monday was the, uh, I think the 13th of April, and we started uh, testing. We started with just with a, a small handful, like six of us, just to make sure our process was right before we had, mm -hmm. had put it out. And then we just started allowing, at the time, I couldn't mandate it, so it was voluntary. But I knew I'd have high participation rate just because everybody was saying, how do I know, how do I know, how do I know? <laughs> now, meanwhile, on the 7th, I start communicating this in daily videos in my, in my, on my YouTube channel. And uh, so people are getting excited about it. And so the intent to start was just test those employees that are on site. No need to test the people working from home just because they weren't coming in and they should be you know, working from home and not going out and doing things. And we had high participation rate for that. And so that testing was, I think, the most important thing that we did to give comfort and protection and be able to make good business decisions during this pandemic. Um, but what's interesting is I actually feel it's more important today than it was in April when we started. Interesting. Why is that? Well, right now, it's very easy to let our guard down. Mm -hmm. You know, fortunately, our numbers in Connecticut right now look good, mm -hmm. but look at every state around. How Every day, there's <laughs> three, five, seven more states put on the do not travel list. Yeah. And when you look at people, you know, it's summertime. People want to go to the shore, whether it's go to Rhode Island, go to Massachusetts, or people want to go places. It's a lot easier to go out. And now more and more businesses are opening. We're susceptible to more things. So for me, it wasn't as risky before because people were leaving work and going home. Now they're leaving work and going, going golfing or they're going to the beach on the weekend. People are taking PTO. We've had to change our PTO policy to, for people to disclose where they're going and how they're getting there. <laughs> right. right? Are they flying? Are they driving? What are they doing? And so now when, when it's easy to let our guard down, this is when it's most important for us to stay focused. So we right. are testing and testing and testing. You know, um, whether it's we've got people that we, we forced to go to second shift back on you know March 16th and said, or March 13th, and we said, let's do it for two weeks and see how it goes. <laughs> and here, here we are 17 weeks later <laughs> and people are still in second shift. We're disrupting lives. Right. We really are. And um, <clears throat> so we said, okay, you wanna come back to first shift? No problem, spit. 24 hours later, we'll get the results, come back to first shift. Right. Or somebody says, oh man, I, you know, I was on the weekend and I was with so-and-so and I just found out that they, they don't feel well. No problem, spit in a cup. Go home, come back when you get a, a, a negative result. So the the comfort we have to make those business decisions to say, okay, yes, we can switch shifts, or you, yes, you just went on vacation, come back and test, or we've got people that were working from home that we really want to have come back on site. No problem now. Test. We still have all of our protocols in place. We still are doing our social distancing. We are having people work out of our East Hartford warehouse, so at least we can get teams back together right. without jeopardizing the production and the direct labor. And uh, you know, we we've had near miss. You know, I used to pride myself as saying, okay, and, you know, we've, we've done 75 tests and we've had no positive cases. Now we've done 125 tests and we've had one positive. Right. But thank God for the process because that was an individual who had been working from home, wanted to come back on site. And we said, okay, fine, come get tested with a, with a negative result. You can come back on site. Tested positive. Sorry. <laughs> Go home. Right. Stay home for two more weeks. Do two more tests. Once you are negative for two tests, then you can come back to work. If we didn't have the testing, we would have let that individual come back to work. And who knows what, what would have happened. happened. Yeah, no, listen, it's amazing. And I think I think there's so much great about it. Number one, you know, we talked off camera about how saliva tests seem to be more uh, accurate because that's where it's all getting transferred from. So the higher viral load in your saliva leads yeah. to a more accurate test. The test itself is, is pretty wide spectrum, which is pretty exciting. The microgen DX right. uh, test, which is pretty cool. Um, and then on top of that, the fact that you get to administer it and get it such a quick turnaround because, you know, you look now and see what's happening, especially with the spike. We went from a two to four day average turnaround. I think we're at four to seven days now because of how backed up Quest and LabCorp and all those other labs are. So to have the control of being able to go test today, come to the parking lot, you don't have to come inside, we'll bring you the cup, you spit in the cup, 
We send it to the lab. 24 hours later, we get a result. It's just, you know, if business is about speed, right. efficiency, and accuracy, right. You've there you go. Speed, efficient, and accurate. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's tremendous. Right. And I think you hit, you hit it right on. I mean, the saliva test is just easy. Mm. We all know how to spit. Yeah. Right? Yes. Do I want Much to, be, to the chagrin of my mom. But yeah, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do I want to be sticking a nasal swab oh. into somebody or do I want to be doing finger pricks? No way. And if you talk to Carol Bodick, our, our head of HR, she's amazing. And she's got a line that she's used quite a bit recently on some of the, uh, you know, some of the webinars that she's been on is in her 30 plus years of being in HR, she never thought she'd be handing out specimen <laughs> jars <laughs> in biohazard bags. Right. Right. But the fact that we can do that got in our parking lot. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's great. I think I think the turnaround is really good. Our speed for us, we wish we could do it right on the spot. But sure. I will it's okay to send somebody home for a day. Sure. Until you get the result. Five days, three days, or just blindly two weeks, how much productivity loss you have. Totally. And or so, even worse, letting them in. Right. Just because default default to open and then next thing you know, right. people are sick. So I'm curious, you know, you guys have done so much. You you alluded to it earlier, so I want to get back to it. Do you believe that there's been tangible business ROI? You talked about the three objectives, right? The keeping the keeping employees, you know, healthy and safe, keeping your customers and your vendors safe, you know, keeping up with production and delivery times and the and the conflict that kind of comes into all that. How are you seeing the positive results? Do you feel the time, energy, money you've invested in in tests, which was thousands, tens of thousands of dollars, plus the time you spent, you know, thinking about the processes, the communication, the YouTube channel, all this stuff. Do you feel there's been positive business ROI? Yeah, I wouldn't say um, necessarily direct ROI to the bottom line, right? Because all this comes with with cost. I know sure. exactly how much we spent <laughs> in Q2 on COVID-related expenses, whether it's testing or whether it's additional facilities, cleaning stuff, protocols, cleaning protocol, PPE, oh, everything. Yeah, it's so it's not a it's not a financial ROI, but it's a continuity of operations ROI, right? The amount of people that we've been able to keep employed and keep touching product because we're doing testing and because we're doing the protocols. Now, if you were to ask my biggest customers, they'd probably be still very, very frustrated because we don't deliver perfectly every time. <laughs> right. But, you know, could be a lot it worse. It could be a lot worse. There's and no I doubt. see other companies I, and I see companies that are shut down. I know exactly. And this was one of the things when all the states were starting to shut down, I stayed up through the night. I knew exactly how many suppliers I had in every state. And so when Pennsylvania shut down and California shut down, this is going back to, you know, that March time frame, I knew exactly how many suppliers I had in each state. My supply chain team was on the phone talking to every supplier, what's the, what's the impact? And I know exactly how much business. I went late to my customer because our suppliers didn't do the protocols that we're doing. And they shut down. And, you know, we had some, and there's been many companies in the state that shut down, whether it's for a whole month or just for two weeks, mm -hmm. that impacts the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And so I did not want to be a company that impacted my customers' supply chain because I was not doing the right things. It's a great place to be, Brian. And I have two editorial comments on that. One is from other people we've spoken to on the podcast, you know, some on camera, some off, have talked about business opportunities, one, because another supplier couldn't deliver because right. they weren't prepared, you know, so that's number one. And number two, especially talking to some of the larger business people, you know, those of us that work mostly in sort of the SMB business, we don't always think so long term, but large business people realize it's the investments and in the things that aren't a direct line on the PL, right? It's easy to make an investment when you can see, oh, I'm going to spend this, I'm going to reduce this, right. and it works. It's the, the companies that that develop over time and are the most valuable are the ones that invest in an idea and a vision that eventually yields a bigger return. And I think that's a little bit what you sure what you talked about. So um, let's talk a bit about, I want to kind of circle back to lean a little bit and talk about how your lean background, or you've been using your lean experience, your continuous improvement experience through the pandemic and how you've been leveraging that both to address the COVID-19 stuff that you've done and also to kind of streamline the business going forward. Yeah, it's a good question. We're hitting it from two sides, you know, um, we have this conversation on it. So every day I have an executive team huddle like most companies are doing right now on task force huddles on, on COVID. And, you know, one of the biggest things we look at is the difference between being productive, effective, and efficient, mm -hmm. right? I, you could talk to every single one of my employees that are working from home and say, we're productive. Yes, I can go online. I can see how, <laughs> that you're connected through VPN. I can see that you're there. Doing something. Doing something. But are we effective and are we efficient at it? Mm -hmm. And we lose a lot of efficiencies through this pandemic. So our focus now is how do we gain back the efficiencies to be more effective? And, you know, delivery effective is one thing, but profitability effective, you know, efficient with it is, is another thing. And so we're looking at right now, how do we Kaizen out our 
COVID protocols? How do we apply lean to what we've had to just force in place going back to March? So I look at how much time and money is being spent on protecting the workforce. And it's the right thing to do. But every day, first shift, you have to come in, get your temperature checked. So we queue up six feet apart, masks and gloves, get that done. But the person that's doing that, they are not productive for that period of time that they're doing that. And then we do it on second shift. And then we clean everything you, at the start of the shift that you're about to touch. Then you clean everything at the end of the shift that you touched. And then we clean everything between shifts. And then the second shift does that. And so how much time are we losing for protection? So right now we're putting a lot of effort into um, how do we how do we lean that out? And then also, how do we get people, more people back working together so that they can be efficient? So the few things that we've got going on with that on the temperature check side, I know a lot of companies are looking at this as well, is temperature scanning kiosks. Right now, every day, you know, we're doing the <laughs> thermal scan. Stand really good. There's some decent technology out there that we're looking at where we can have, it does facial recognition. It could tell if you have a mask on, come in, load it to the, you know, to the database. I walk up, it knows it's me, a temperature check, supervisor can get a list, here's everybody that hasn't checked in yet today, mm. right? And more importantly, just go no-go on that. So that's one thing. Um, from the efficiency of getting people back to work, you know, I, I, I'm a big team person, right? I think there's, you know, one plus one isn't two mm. right, when you work together, but it's so difficult now with everybody remote. So we brought our, our finance and accounting team back together, but they're working out of our East Hartford warehouse location. I don't have a lot of offices there, so we're kind of at capacity. So we're looking at a couple of things now. We're looking at just mobile trailers, mobile office trailers. We have some quotes to bring, you know, three trailers directly into our parking lot in Glastonbury in the back and let customer service be in one. We can let supply chain be in another. We can get the teams back together. They could be distant from everybody else, still socially distant within the trailer, but be together. Mm -hmm. We're looking at some things we could do to our actual facility, like blocking off certain sections mm -hmm. and certain bathrooms, just like a lot of people have done with zones. We, like on the production floor, we're looking at that from the office area. Okay, this You is guys good. have like multiple entrances, multiple levels, Correct. so you've got some opportunities. We have some opportunities, so that's yeah. a big piece. I think that will gain us huge dividends in, in the efficiency. And is it your lean background that you think is giving you like the process to go through to execute this? Or is this just right, some, of it's business? some of it's common sense, but I think the philosophy of whatever we put in place, knowing it could be done better is mm. the lean part. So when we put these things in place, we say, okay, we got to get it in place, but what's next? You know, and then like one of the other things we're looking at from the cleaning side is something I'm super excited about. The First of all, I don't even, none of us know what are the side effects from all the, all the <laughs> chemical cleaning that we're doing. And, you know, it's like the last thing I want to know is, you know, I'm, because we think it's the right thing to do, we're forcing all these people to be doing Lysol, Clorox, all these different things. But what's going to happen <sighs> six months from now with, right. with those individuals? So our energy service provider who we get all of our, our LED lights from that we've done different um, utility upgrades with, they've partnered with a company that has an amazing technology that we've uh, contracted to move forward with. So we're going to have monitor air quality monitors that we're putting in place that measures the particulate matter in the air, measures the VOCs, the temperature, the humidity, and we can get dashboards. So you can walk into a room, and if it's green, you know there's no, you know, you know that the particulate matter, the virus, the bacteria, the VOCs that's in the air is at a is, is at a good level. If it's yellow or red, you got to do something about it. Now I don't necessarily want to put these monitors up, have everybody see red and walk out. <laughs> right. So what do we do about it? So they have two things. They partner with Samsung on this, and it's an amazing technology that I can't wait to put in place. So now we'll have the monitors, but we can spray titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide is in so many things. It's in sunscreen. It's in yogurt. It's in paint. It's in all these different things. It's, it's just a very known uh, product out there. And if you saw on TV when the pandemic hit in China, in Asia, they were outside spraying a lot. Mm. They were spray spraying titanium dioxide because when titanium dioxide interacts with the sun, it cleans, it sanitizes the air. And so what the manufacturer of the LED lights that we have, or the, they are able to put a UVA emitter in the lights that acts like the sun. Like a spray. Or, and yeah. so now it interacts with the titanium dioxide, we can spray with the UVA emitters in the light, and it's constantly cleaning and sanitizing the air. It's the only product that I've seen. Almost like having sunlight inside the room. Exactly. So we talked about how outside being in the sunlight, and then we've all heard about sort of like bacteria dies usually pretty quickly Correct. in the sunlight. Yeah. That's exactly. And the UVA, the UVA is really cool. Most of us see UVC. It's the blue light. You know, there's yeah. a lot of those robots that you can see that yeah. go out and do that, but you can't look at that. That's harmful. The UVA right. is less than the light coming off your cell phone. So it's very low level light. It's it's very so we can have it in the in in our in our uh, in our LED lights, and it's constantly interacting. What I love about it, it's the only thing I've seen that actually fights 
all the time and in the air. Almost right. all the other spray that's out there, it's surface spray, mm -hmm. and you still gotta clean your surfaces. So this is we'll spray titanium dioxide once and it'll last three to five years. Five years on surfaces that you don't touch often, like your ceiling. Three years on your desks and, and things that you touch regularly. So think about like, you know, I, my, the way my simple mind works, it's kind of like one of those, uh, like a bug zapper. A bug comes up, it zaps. Right. So now somebody comes in, they sneeze. The titanium dioxide is interacting with the UVA and it's, it's killing it in the air. Right. So and, you're going to get lower spread, hopefully make the environment itself even cleaner. But from what I'm getting from you, I don't get a suntan, though. You do not get a suntan. All right. Clean yeah. air, but no suntan. Clean, right, yeah. 50 50. On yeah, that. exactly. Right, nice. But that's you know, awesome. But that's this is another example, Brian, leading the way, right? Looking at technologies that are out there, you know, leading and, and that type of leading behavior that drives Habco from a business perspective, too. Right. And, and you go back to the why, right? I talked earlier, like, I don't want to put my kids in harm's way or my family in harm's way. So when I found out about this technology and one of my, one of my daughters is going to go off to, uh, to prep school to play hockey in the fall and I'm talking to, talk to the school about <laughs> right. it. My brother-in-law is the president of a university. He told him about it. He's going to be the first university in the country to put this in place because his revenue stream is his employees, is, is people students, coming in, people coming right. in and the parents are the ones paying the bills, most, mm -hmm. some of them. And they want to know, right, what kind of environment am I putting my child in? Absolutely. Right? So I, I, I just think it's, you know, this is good stuff, mm. you know, and, you know, we talked earlier, um, you know, about the impact that Habco's business. There's a part of me that really wishes I could have done more, not necessarily for my employees, but just in general, you know, there was huge needs for PPE. There were huge needs for ventilators, respirators. I've got my, I used to work at a medical device company. You know, I, I, I know that world. And, you know, I had some phone calls with my prior company to see if they needed help, even though I didn't have the capacity right. because I have my own demand. Yeah, yeah. And so one of the things I've tried to focus on in the last four plus months is how can I help outside of Habco? Right. Um, you know, one of my good friends works for the Gilman Brothers company. Their business was decimated. They extrude foam for the, the marketing industry and they developed a cool product where they can extrude the foam and make beds out of it. And I was able to connect them with Colin Cooper in the state. And next thing you know, they got ordered and they, they made thousands and thousands of beds for these pop up hospitals. Mm -hmm. That made me feel good. Was there a single benefit for Brian Moss and our <laughs> Habco? No. But this is the time when everybody has to come together. If you see an opportunity, if you see something to make somebody else's life better, that's what it's about. Got to do it. I 100% agree. And I want to actually, we got to start wrapping up, Brian, but one couple of things I wanted to ask you before we get off that. You brought up some of your past experiences. And for those that saw your first episode, they'll know about all the work you did. I, I don't know. I call them turnaround projects. Maybe that's not a fair statement. But, you know, after you left Wire Mold, you know, you went to CNM, yeah. you know, you went to HID, you know, you've been right. places and really turned them around. If I remember correctly, you know, HID was one of the worst performing business units that they had. It right. was taking them longer. If I remember the quote was, it was taking them longer to produce a custom ID badge than it took Boeing to build the 737. You got a really good uh, memory, my friend. That's, yeah. that's, that's insane, by the that's way, on so many levels. Yeah. So I wonder, did all of your experience going around businesses large and small and helping turn them around, have you been leveraging that experience now? You know, I don't know if you want to call COVID a turnaround project, but it's tough, man. There's a lot of demands, a lot of things. You know, you're coming in, not a lot of stuff's out of your control. Some of it's in, you know, do those experiences or do you call on them to kind of stay cool under fire and, and see the future and believe in it? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, that for you? you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting because I actually, I don't actually think of it like a switch where, okay, <laughs> time to turn lean on, <laughs> right? It's either in you because you've got experience or you're working at it. Um, so I think it's just part of who I am and it, I try as hard as I can to make it just be part of everybody else in the organization. But I think one of the other things we talked about the last podcast we did in January, I spoke so much about hiring people that are smarter. Mm. And I think that's one of the, the biggest blessings that we've had that, you know, the folks that we've been able to hire, especially my executive team, they're far smarter, far more experienced in their world than I am. And we've got some great folks. Our new chief operating officer is an ex wire mold person, uh, Rich Levesque, and he comes with tremendous experience. So it's just so, it's such a blessing to have another person. And there's multiple people within the organization like that. And the more people you have that have that mindset, the easier it is to be on the same page to just click without saying, okay, time to put our lean hat on. Mm -hmm. You know, at times we have to do that. We have to step back and say, shoot, I know we did that. We just got that product out with brute force. <laughs> I don't ever want to do that again, right? Because sometimes you have to you just gotta get, it done. You gotta yeah. get it done. So, so does that help you? Like, I mean, you know, you talked also last time about coming out of the 2010, you know, looking at the business and saying, all right, we need to re-rationalize yeah. 
our business? Do we have the right product mix? Are the products that we are we doing make sense? Do we have the right customer mix? You going through that process again now? We are a little bit differently. Um, you know, so thankful that we're as diversified in the aerospace industry uh, as we are. And when I sat here in January, we had so much discussion was about the commercial mm -hmm. world. And in January, uh, we redid our our business plan. And it's something we update, you know, fairly often, once every, you know, at least every year, sometimes every two years. And I hadn't done it in two years because we just had so much going on. And I went back and read the business plan that Jeff and I put together and how much of it was so focused on the growth of the commercial world, right? So we, we have to continue to reinvent ourselves without forgetting our roots, right? I, I love the commercial aerospace world just as much as I love the military world. And the commercial will come back, but I have to, we have to be looking at what else can we do now? Is it adjacent within military? Is it, can we step in where other companies on the commercial side can't? The commercial side is just really difficult right now because there are so many people looking for work. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to gobble up every opportunity we can, deliver the product that we have, deliver it on time and right the first time so that as it grows, they, those customers have no reason to look anywhere else. Mm -hmm. The military side is where they're, right now we're, we're, we're putting a lot of focus, continued focus on and, and leveraging the license agreements that we have to go capture more of that, uh, more of that world. So the so kind of going through that same process, but maybe you guys have already done that. So there's not as much low hanging fruit to kind of work through. Yeah, the rationalization right now is more on the make buy decision side. You know, Got so it. we've signed these license agreements, and we're exclusive in a lot of these for the license agreements. So we don't have the ability to say no, <laughs> right? Unless we unless, give up the uh, yeah, yeah. And it's you know you you don't want a customer calling and say hey. Pratt or Sikorsky, you licensed Habco, but they don't want to quote us. Right. I want every order I can get. So you have how, to get the whole donut. You can't just take the whole that, that's for correct. the outside. Right? Exactly. So the how do we do it in a manner, how would we rationalize today to do it in a manner that's best for our customer? And like I mentioned earlier before, we didn't have the capability, so right, or capacity. So what we did is like we would just continue to invest in equipment. We've got two large pieces of equipment to, being delivered in August that before we were we were sending out to suppliers. So our rationalization today is more make buy. Oh, gotcha. As opposed to what products can we or can't we do? Because we have to do every product that we get a request for. Right. Where in 2009, 2010, we stopped doing that custom one-off test right. test stands. Um, and we're just not in that same position today. It's a different rationalization. Different, yeah. Well, like I said, sometimes the low hanging fruit, although that was a hard decision anyway. Huge. Yeah. Um, so listen, Brian, we're going to wrap it up, but I want to ask you this and maybe we'll come back to this uh, six, 12 months from now and figure out where you were right and where you were wrong. <laughs> what, what do you see in the aerospace industry over the next 12 to 18 months? Like, what do you look at the runway is? Do you, you know, what do you see? And give me the commercial and the military side, you know, I mean, because you touched, you touched on it, right? Military has been sort of strong. There's some conversation of, is it going to remain strong? But even if it is strong, the competition on it is probably 10x what it was right. six months ago. And then the commercial. So just curious, your thoughts, what do you see when you're planning forward for Habco? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, um, I don't see the commercial passenger travel coming back to 2019 levels anytime soon. I mean, just how easy was it for us to hop on a plane? And, it's, and for me, it's not so much, can we fly? Because the answer is yes. You can hop on a plane tomorrow and you can get where you want to go. Mm. But how, and, and it's not even so much how comfortable are you on the plane. Because I think the airlines are going to do a really good job. They take this very seriously. And whether they're leaving the middle seats open or whether you're, you're jumping on a plane with a full hazmat suit because you don't <laughs> touch me, that's your choice. You can right, do right. that. But when's the next time you're going to feel comfortable slipping in the bed, you know, slipping yeah. in the sheets of a bed of a hotel that you had no bearing mm. on the cleaning of it? And the, in no ability to determine if it's been clean. You know, you, can you take a blue light like some people I know <laughs> travel and check to see what's in the bed? Sure, but can you check to see what's in the air? No. How do you know yeah. when when the last time they sanitized the remote control was versus mm. you know the iron? And so to me, it's just so much deeper when it goes to travel versus just hopping on a plane. And Not to mention some of the things we would travel for. Like when do you see big conventions right. coming, Brock? Who's going to Mardi Gras? Like yeah. you know, I mean, sporting events, even concerts. Correct. I mean, it's just you think about the list of stuff I've traveled for. Right. One of those things even going to come Correct. back. Correct. So for all those reasons, you know, to me, it's a minimum of 2022 before we even think about seeing 2019 passenger mm -hmm. uh, le le travel levels come back up. <clears throat> and that's still to be determined. I mean, some of these podcasts, uh, the webinars I've been on with CBI recently and listening to some of the medical professionals, the amount of mutations and everything that's going on mm -hmm. there, we, we, you know, it, it's scary. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we need to be bracing to be dealing with this in some manner for, for quite some time. You know, so I, you know, unfortunately, I see it taking 
a while on the commercial side. Um, in my world, I do expect to see a pickup in the in the maintenance and the overhaul repair. I think it gives um, you know some of these airlines might you might mothball some of the older aircraft, but do more maintenance on some of the new aircraft. Um, so there will be business, but it won't be like it was in '19. Uh, the military side for us, you know, we're fortunate to be um, tied in with some of the major military programs on both the fixed wing and rotary wing side. So as long as those continue to move forward with the the demand that in the and the with the demand that's been placed on us, that'll be fine. Um, again, I want to get more than that in looking at some of those other programs or other um, other OEM partners uh, to be able to backfill for some of the commercial stuff. And then lastly, I just want to ask you your thoughts on how the manufacturing community, and I know you're more plugged in with the aerospace, so if you want to talk about just the aerospace manufacturing community, but how have you seen the community either come together or fall apart during this crisis in Connecticut specifically? Yeah, you know, um, I, I mentioned earlier about helping people. You know, mm -hmm. it's something I took on as a personal uh, just passion, I guess. I love seeing what I've seen, especially in Connecticut. I mean, it, it is a small world you know some mm -hmm. manufacturing especially aerospace but you know folks like colin cooper have just been amazing i think we are blessed as a state to have him in that role mm -hmm. i am sure he did not know what he was signing up for <laughs> when he decided to jump into this especially given the pandemic but we're we're very fortunate to have people like colin cooper like christy pentima coming to cbia joe brennan bonnie del conte there's so many advocates paul murphy, paul murphy on ACM. Say, don't forget paul yeah i know I, I love paul um there's so many people out there that are just truly passionate about manufacturing whether it's aerospace or not but passionate about connecticut and and i think through them and through their leadership it's allowed folks like me and others to help each other out you know when i found out that a, a, a friend of a friend who owns a construction company has had a huge supply of masks and gloves one of my first phone calls was to paul murphy who immediately bought a whole bunch of stuff and then went out to the whole acm group and said hey we just got the supply you want to buy some mm -hmm. i mean that's what it's about mm -hmm. you know there was nothing i there was there's been very little if any that i've seen throughout manufacturing of people hoarding saying this is an idea i have and i'm not going to tell anybody I, I i love the fact that microgen dx was able to sell a lot of kits and especially in connecticut i bet yeah. you know i'd love to see their analytics <laughs> to see connecticut versus other states and it's and that's because people want to share they want to help it is a tough environment connecticut is a tough state to do business in uh for, you know and it's a whole different podcast right. right but it's a great state to do business in if you work together mm -hmm. and you care for your employees, you care, care for your, you got to care for your suppliers. You got to care for even your competitors. Yeah. And the amount of times you see competitors helping each other out because in the end it's good for the supply chain. No question about it. And I think that's, I just wanted to end on that point because you're hundred percent right, Brian. And I think what's more, you've been a leader in that whole area, not just leading in what you're doing for Habco, but as you alluded to, and I don't think you've given yourself enough credit, you've led the way in people working together. You've been the first to share your information. If I ever had someone that needed to know about something, I asked you, you come out with the person, you, you know, you're, you're never looking for your cut, looking for your credit, yeah. just trying to make things happen. And I think one of the missions of this podcast has been to believe that if we share our experiences together, we'll all rise together. Absolutely. Uh, it's a global economy. We're in this together. Right. Uh, so thanks for coming on, sharing your views today. My Always pleasure. a pleasure to see you, B. My pleasure. Thanks, All right, man. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct. As always, thanks so much for tuning in. I definitely want your feedback and hope you subscribe. But what I want the most is to build a community where we learn and grow with each other. I hope you're getting a lot of value out of the time we're spending together. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next time.